Hello, it's Chloe here from World Have Your Say. Thank you for downloading the podcast of our programme for Monday the 16th of May 2016. We spent the whole hour today discussing comments made by Angelina Jolie-Pitt. Speaking on behalf of the UN, she was talking about migration and the challenges that that poses for countries all around the world. She said it's everybody's responsibility to help these people and she was talking as part of the BBC's World on the Move Day. Some people have been criticising what she said, saying it's too simplistic. Other people commending her for speaking out and saying that it's making people have a conversation once more about the migration crisis. Now, if you'd like to see our terms of use, please head to bbc.co.uk forward slash terms. Here's today's programme. Hello, welcome to World Have Your Say. Chloe Tilly live with you for the next hour. And lots of you have been picking up on the hashtag World on the Move as the BBC spends the day focusing on migration. A few hours ago, I watched Angelina Jolie-Pitt, the UN Refugee Agency's special envoy, make a speech here at Broadcasting House in London. She was calling on everyone, including governments, you and me, to act. She talked about the fear of uncontrolled migration, eroding public confidence in government's abilities to deal with the situation. and how the politics of fear and separation is being promoted. She went on to say it created the risk of a race to the bottom with countries competing to be the toughest. Well, straight after she'd finished speaking, I spoke to some teenagers who'd also listened to her speech and they shared with us conversations they've been having with Syrian school children in Damascus. And over the next hour, we're also going to get reaction from migrants themselves, including an Afghan journalist who's sitting here opposite me in the World Have Your Say studio. She and her family fled the country Country before the Taliban took power. We'll also hear from people in countries directly affected by the migration crisis. But first, for those of you who haven't heard all of Angelina Jolie Pitt's speech, we're going to play you the highlights right now so you can understand what she was talking about. And one of the points she raised was that this isn't just a European problem. The spotlight has been firmly on Europe, but the crisis in Europe is only a fraction of the global refugee problem. And therefore, the solutions being discussed for Europe are only a fraction of the overall answer. We in the West are neither at the center of the refugee crisis, nor for the most part, the ones making the greatest sacrifice. The majority of the world's refugees live in countries such as Turkey, Pakistan, Lebanon, Iran, Ethiopia, and Jordan. So my argument is that unless we address the root causes of the crisis, we will not see a slowing of the number of refugees crossing borders. And in fact, quite the opposite. Countries around the world will be asked to do more and more. European nations are currently negotiating to resettle 10% of refugees from just one conflict, Syria, while other countries are bursting at the seams with millions of refugees from multiple conflicts. So what we must do first and foremost as citizens is to demand our governments show the leadership necessary to address the fundamental causes of the refugee crisis at a global level. She also said the debate is being hijacked by some people who want to promote fear. On one hand, the refugee crisis has produced great acts of generosity and solidarity with refugees here in Europe and in other parts of the world. And on the other hand, fear of uncontrolled migration has eroded public confidence and the ability of governments and international institutions to control the situation. It has given space to a false air of legitimacy to those who promote politics of fear and separation. It has created the risk of a race to the bottom with countries competing to be the toughest in the hope of protecting themselves, whatever the cost or challenge to their neighbors, and despite their international responsibilities. But since no country can seal itself off from the impact of the refugee crisis, such a free-for-all would lead to an even greater set of problems. It would amount to the worst of both worlds failing to tackle the issue and undermining international law and our values in the process. Well, Angelina Jolie-Pitt went on to say that we all have a responsibility to act. I believe this is, again, that once-in-a-generation moment 
when nations have to pull together. How we respond will determine whether we create a more stable world or face decades of far greater instability. At its extremes, the debate about refugees in Western nations has been polarized, with on one hand some people calling for open borders, and on the other hand, for the complete exclusion of all refugees, or worse, for certain groups of refugees. But policies should not be d d driven by emotion, by what might be termed as naive humanitarianism, placing the perceived needs of refugees above all other considerations, or by irrational fear and unacceptable prejudice. Instead, we need to find a rational center, rebuilding public confidence and ensuring democratic consent for the long-term approach that will be needed. Well, after her speech, Angelina Jolie-Pitt took questions from some of the people in the audience, including Nelifar, who's sitting opposite me here. We'll speak to her in a moment, but also David Davis, the Conservative MP. I mean, Jolie uh, Pitt, you, I think you recognised in your compelling speech the need to go to the source of these problems. You've said that they're wearing down countries, the, the ongoing problem. After the Second World War, America, by its leadership and its resource, with the Marshall Plan and so on, went to the source of the problem and solved it. Is there a chance that America will go to the source of this problem, not with bombs, but with money, power, influence, diplomatic effort, uh, to solve some of the sources of these problems, uh, particularly, dare I say it, after the coming presidential election? Oh, I can... <laughs> Easy question. Uh, well, all I can say is they absolutely should, and they better, and uh, and and not alone. I think they have to work with countries around the world as before, but uh, but that is what they they must do, and it's and it's uh, it's it's something that we we as a as an American, I will be pressing my own government and speaking loudly about it. But I have been very very disheartened by. Uh, by my own country's response to this situation. By, uh, <coughs> by people like Donald Trump, uh, who uh, has talked not only about building a, a fence, a wall on the border with Mexico, but banning Muslims from the United States. You're shaking your head. Well, Anyone it's, it's who's hard, listening it's hard rather to than respond watching. to that. You know, I mean, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I, I can't, it's hard for me, you know, to me, America is built on on, pe on people from around the world coming together for, for freedoms and, and uh, uh, especially freedom of religion. And, and so it is, it is hard to hear that this is coming from uh, somebody who is uh, pressing to be an American president. Well, straight after Angelina Jolie pitches speech, Pitt's speech here at the BBC. We stepped out of the radio theatre and spoke to some students from Oakland School in London in the media cafe next door to the radio theatre. And we wanted to find out what they'd made of what she said. I spoke to Atik, Samira, Rabia and Fataya, who've been working on a project with students in Damascus in Syria. So we've just walked out of this keynote speech by Angelina Jolie. What did you make of it? Considering the project we've been working on with Damascus children and how their lives have been affected by the conflicts in Syria, it was a really good opportunity to be listening to to be listening to such an iconic role model of someone who has very strong perspectives in the political world and idea of the situation and how it's being tackled to help these refugees and these um, children that are currently struggling to even have a stable life and I think a lot of us really share the same political views as her and she was and I think a lot of the children that we've been having building a relationship with they would really appreciate what they've what she's been saying and I think we need some immediate and fast um, action to be able to tackle the situation. So explain for people listening around the world you've been talking to teenagers like yourselves in Damascus so what have you been discussing and, and how did you link up with them? Uh, we, we talked to them through Skype and then um, we were just comparing our lives and what, how it's different to theirs and they were opening up about how they would like to have like better surroundings and a better environment for their learning because they re they're a lot more passionate about their education more than us, but 
Probably because they're going to have to fight for it, whereas you guys get it. It's that age-old thing, isn't it? If it's if it's there delivered for you, I guess you, we almost take it for granted. What sort of stories were they telling you then about how difficult it was living in Damascus? We had to give like stuff that we didn't like about our schools. One of the things that we said were we felt like our school school corridors were too small, and their response was that they didn't have any corridors. So that really. Uh, it hit home. No, but it hit home to you. So, were they going to school? Did they have a school to go to, or had it had it been bombed? They did have a school to go to, and it wasn't obviously it wasn't as um, well equipped as our school. So, well, what what stories? What stories did they did they tell you? Um, I think the biggest um, part was when we. Um, we used, they used to tell us how when they left for school, it was like they treat um, they we say goodbye to your parents like it's the last time they see them, and then that's when we kind of were just like wow we leave our parents every morning thinking we're gonna come back to them, so it was kind of upsetting, and then that's when you realise how um, different our lives are, but then you don't think of them as that different because when we were talking to them because they are age and everything we all got along so well and then you think of them as just because they're in a war-torn country doesn't mean they're any different to us and yeah we became like really good friends and we kind of learned from them as well and they kind of made us better people and they made us appreciate our education much more. I would say I think ultimately our passions and our ambitions that we had they were very very similar we all want to be doctors lawyers scientists so many things and it makes you so guilty to know that we have a potential chance to become that we have such a you know easy and simple timetable and schedule to be able to wake up in the morning feeling safe feeling happy going to school whereas they as soon as they wake up they're in fear and they're in doubt of returning back home again it just makes you feel so guilty knowing that and that really made us appreciate our education way more. It's interesting also that you talked about fear there because one of the points that Angelina Jolie Pitt made was about fear and certain countries particularly in Europe with so many people making the journey to get a better life in Europe and um, take asylum in Europe was saying that countries were fearing the people who were coming would you agree with that do you think there's an element of fear there of people coming to the UK and to Europe? I think fear is just an excuse. I mean, because all these people that come in, they kind of build countries and make it up. I mean, so many people um, contribute to how our system works anyways. And also, some another excuse would probably be space, and then they'd say, oh, we don't have enough space, or they'd have taken a certain number of people, but we actually do have the space. And then I think it's just the fear of taking on responsibility for all these lives. I don't think that they're actually scared of them taking away everything we have is the fear of having to have responsibility over the lives and then but then that kind of differs to the actual people that are actually coming in because for example the people that we skyped with in Damascus you think that they'd be so scared because the only children going to school by themselves every morning when there's a war going on and when we asked them about it it's like it didn't even matter to them because all that them had was their education. So. It was a risk that they were willing to take because that was the most important thing, getting that education. What, what did you think about the, the element of fear that Angelina was talking about? I thought that it was quite ridiculous and a bit, a bit sort of really irresponsible for any country or nation to be thinking that. I think that we should consider that their fear is greater than having the fear of you know, letting migrants in and I think that I would re agree with Samir in fact I think that would just be an excuse rather and it's to know that so many countries are opening up borders and then there's immediately you know, stereotyping um, migrants and refugees into current situations, current conflicts I, I don't think that's fair at all uh, she's, she's saying how it's ridiculous I, I think it's ridiculous because these people are like in desperate need of help and then I don't get how they could be Intimidating or create fear for the people, because they just they just need help. That's all. That's all it is. And then children just need education. I don't get why it would be scary. I think it's just like a false portrait of what the media is creating of the people immigrants. Uh, so I want to say that it's, I feel it's kind of rude and selfish because of people to think like this, because we are just blessed with everything that we already have and we take it for granted. And then. Um, because we don't want to lose this, I feel like people are saying no to um, refugees and migrants and that's why they don't want them to come. Mm. I mean, there are fears, aren't there, in, in Europe, not just about the people themselves coming, but, you know, 
economically how countries can afford such a huge influx of people, you know, a million people going to Germany in a year. Some people might say that Angelina Jolie Pitt's um, speech was a little bit idealistic, saying we should welcome everybody in, we should all look after each other. The reality for some countries is they don't have a lot of money, there's high unemployment. Do you think at times it was idealistic because there were no solutions provided there? It was just talking about how we should all help one another. I think in speech, it wasn't really idealistic. I think it's just it was just really full of hope. And then the way she said it is as if we she shouldn't have to have say um, to say this country should do this, we should do that. It's, we should just listen to her speech and think, oh yeah, we should do this. We have responsibility. And um, I feel like you know some countries they don't have space and stuff like that, or they they just can't take in people even if they want to. I think the big focus on the bigger countries, the big places that can take in places, but they just refuse to. Um, and yeah, they should be people that are blameable right now because um, say Germany and stuff like that obviously they played a really big part in um, helping with this crisis and then there's other massive countries that aren't doing anything and then there's a lot of little countries that want to do a lot but they can't. That's, obviously there are people who have solutions so um, she alone can't have like solutions for everything that's why she was saying um, we need to join together and help people in these crises and um, eventually, it might, it's not idealistic. I mean, most suggestions are idealistic. If you think about it, you just need to, as long as we help. Well, that was Atik, Samira, Rabia and Fataya, all from Oakland School in London, speaking to me a little bit earlier on. Four 15-year-olds. I'm not sure I was that eloquent when I was 15. Um, let me introduce to a couple of guests who are sitting opposite me here in the World Have Your Say studio. Nella Farhadayat is a British Afghan journalist, was in uh, the radio theatre as I was um, listening to Angelina Jolie-Pitt speaking earlier today. And Hind Suleiman, a student from Saudi Arabia who's been on World Have Your Say before. Welcome back, Hind. Um, Nelifar, first of all, what did you make of the speech that Angelina Jolie made? I'm going to try to be as articulate as those those kids, and I, I really hope I do a good enough job. I mean, I did think it was quite idealistic, but what I fear most is that it simplified things that are other way, otherwise incredibly complex. So as a, as a refugee myself, I came to this country in 1994, from Afghanistan. Um, and this was before the Taliban. This was during the Mujahideen's time. And, uh, Mujahideen's time. And, you know, so many factors go into you leaving. Where do you go? First, I, I, we went to Pakistan deciding that things will calm down in a few years and we'll leave. I was there for years and years and nothing changed. So when we decided to come to the UK, personally, my family, it was a huge decision to make. And so many things that she was talking about, for example, you know, the terminology, the labels that we associate. She made a differentiation between a refugee and a migrant and then an economic migrant. And then you can add to this list. You can continue, you know, you can go on about asylum seekers and what type of country and where. And, and what I find really difficult about doing that is that these terms aren't always helpful. By putting people in nice, tidy little boxes, it's easy to assume um, and to quickly dismiss something, especially something like this. I mean, this is the largest movement of people in the history of, of, of humanity, of in the world. So it's very, very complex. These people come from all sorts of places with all sorts of problems. And I'm just worried that terming things like economic migrants, an economic migrant going from London to Oslo is very different from an economic migrant coming from Lagos to London. So all of these kind of things seem a bit arbitrary to me. And I was worried that at times she was simplifying things that were really quite complex. And that was the point that you made when you asked your question, wasn't it? That you, you felt that. Did you feel you got a satisfactory answer from her? Yes and no. I mean, I, 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 I loved all the things she said about Afghans, I've got to say. That was really nice. I mean, she spoke about Afghans in the nicest way possible. And all of that is great because one of the things we have to understand and acknowledge is people like um, Angelina Jolie-Pitt have their place in this debate, right? They, they attract a certain kind of person that probably doesn't listen to the news all the time, that probably doesn't check up on, you know, the BBC app or whatever all the time. So for these people, they will listen to this message because it's Angelina Jolie Pitt speaking. But for those of us like me who are affected by it and who are really engrossed in, and, and, and try to understand this thing, I worry that her answer just seems slightly, just, just a bit too simple and, and and I didn't feel that I got a real answer from it um but then again you know 
I don't know what to expect from her. She, she occupies a very strange position for me. She's a multi-million dollar, you know, AAA list celebrity actress, director, who is shining a light on a very important issue, but coming from a slightly different place. So I, I, I don't think she answered my question, but I think it's important that she tried to. And the reason we're talking about it here on World Have You Say is because so many people are talking about this on social media. She has got that debate reignited. So how old were you when you came to the UK? I came when I was six and, and I had tr my, my family um, had tried desperately to try to make it work. My mum's a civil engineer. Um, my dad was a professor in university. So we thought when things died down, um, we would go back. And remember, the Taliban at the time were better than the people that were there before. Now, that's hard to imagine for, for you and me sitting here. But my mum tells me that the Taliban brought order in a, in a place that was otherwise just hellish. So when we left to Pakistan, we thought we might go back. When we left for the UK, we knew there was no going back. And just a really important point to mention as well is that, she, and, and again, this is what something that Jolie Pitt said, is that a lot of these immigrants migrants, refugees, whatever you want to call them, from Syria, from uh, Afghanistan, from Iran, wherever they might be coming from, they're not the poorest of the poor. These people are often middle class, often have a decent job. And listening to the Today programme this morning, there was a brilliant package uh, with, a, with a young woman from Egypt who used to be a banker. Uh, and, and so I, I just, I have a sense that we're oversimplifying things that are vastly complex and a well-meaning speech isn't going to do much really to change that. Certainly when I was on the um, Austrian-Slovenian border last year in September of last year, the majority of Syrians that I met were exactly that. They were middle class. One woman I met, she had three houses. Their family had three houses. They'd sold all of them and she said the only benefit to that was they had a bit more money so they could choose the type of rickety boat they came across the ocean on rather than a really small dangerous one it was slightly safer and therefore she said she felt lucky if that you can possibly think that in their circumstances so it's an interesting point that you raised there Nelfa. Hind I want to bring you in what did you make of um, Angelina Jolie Pitt's speech today? I think it's good to hear like someone like Angelina Jolie speaking about these issues because um, as you said is the public will not be listening to us uh, unless it's coming from someone who is celebrity right? Uh, but then I think it's idealistic because um, she mentioned um, addressing the the kind of um, roots like the of that pr the problem, but she didn't really suggest anything. And I think it's not okay. What 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 led us to this crisis? It's conflicts and wars, and this is what we need to address. I think the UN and she has like the the U, the, the the UN envoy of uh, refugees. Um, this is her position. Um, the UN as a system, as an international system, is failing us and it's failing refugees as well. Because when you think of Yemen, when you think of Yemen, now Saudi Arabia is an intervention in Yemen is is actually um, no one actually mentioned the, the Yemeni refugees like with Angelina Jolie. And now, actually, in Yemen, it's even worse than in Syria because. They can't leave the country. This is a case, isn't it? There are 60 million displaced people around the world. Angelina Jolie was saying that's one in every 122 people, which is an incredible statistic to try and get your head around. We're going to be joined by more guests after the news, so we'll carry on discussing this issue. If you've got a question for anyone, you can get involved on Twitter. The hashtag is WHYS. Hello, welcome back to World Have Your Say. Chloe Tilly live with you for the next half an hour. Now, more than 60 million people, one in 122, are displaced globally. It's more than at any time in the past 70 years. And as Europe tries to tackle the migration crisis, Angelina Jolie-Pitt, the UN Refugee Agency's special envoy, has been warning against a fear of migration and a race to the bottom as countries compete to be the toughest to protect themselves. Well, as part of the BBC's World on the Move Day, she's been speaking here at the BBC's Broadcasting House in London, calling for collective action from governments and from each and every one of us. Well, we're picking through your conversations, including criticism, saying that it's easy for a Hollywood A-lister to be so idealistic. But what about the genuine fear that local communities and infrastructure can't cope with the sheer numbers who've been heading to Europe? Remember, more than a million last year. They're also concerned about unemployment, weak economies and the cultural differences between groups. We're going to be discussing this over the next half an hour. If you 
you want to get in touch with us, head to Twitter, use the hashtag WHYS, and I'll pick those comments up which are coming in to us. We're still joined by Nella Farhadayat, who's a British Afghan journalist, and also Hin Suleiman, who's a student from Saudi Arabia. They're sitting opposite me here in the World Have Your Say studio. But we're also joined by uh, Nick Masinski, who is a PhD researcher working on refugee and migration policy at the City University of New York. Nick, welcome to World Have Your Say. What did you make of what Angelina Jolie said today? Do you think it was too simplistic, too idealistic? Uh, well, thank you for having me on. Um, I actually don't think it's too idealistic. It's not idealistic to believe that uh, asylum is a human right. Human rights uh, like this have been respected for over 60 years. Uh, states are continuing to honor these rights. So it's not, I mean, it's not idealistic to ask states to uh, actually uh, do what they said they were supposed to do 60 years ago. I mean, uh, if you're fleeing a conflict and uh, you go to another country and ask for support, how can we turn them away? We, we, we can't. And uh, if we talk about the infrastructure problem, there really isn't a, a, a problem that if you put more money on it and, uh, and put organizations and NGOs who work tirelessly to integrate people, it won't hurt communities. And I worked for three years at a, a community organization called Migrants Organize in London uh, to help uh, integrate migrants. And we know how to do it. It just takes time and a little bit of money. And after a few years, people are contributing members to society. Nick, it really I, is. Yeah, I, go ahead. Hi, it's Nella for here. I just wanted to say that um, as a refugee myself here in Britain, when, when I came here to London uh, all those years ago uh, in 1994, certain things, everything was slightly, was very different, but, but mainly there were no terms like asylum seeker didn't exist. Um, so that I think it's really important to remember that the landscape uh, of, of migration, of immigration, of refugees, why we're coming, has all changed drastically. And it is a little, I don't know, it's a little simplistic just for her to, to demand these things of, of world superpowers. I mean, we're talking post 2008, after a huge, you know, world financial crisis, people are worried, people are jittery, you've got loads of people lurching to the le left of politics, to the right of politics, trying to find the answers to all these questions. So, it, you know, it's easy to, for, for, for me, especially to sit here in London, and expect more of my neighbours and my colleagues and everybody else, when actually, I can understand the fears that they have about the unknown. And that's what we're talking about. It is the fear of the unknown. Um, and that's what people are worried about. It's not that people don't want to welcome, you know, often middle class refugees and asylum seekers, people who aren't the poorest of the poor coming here with skills, with the ability to uh, kind of, you know, assimilate and be part of the society, wherever that might be in the world. The problem is, is we don't know what the big result of this is. And again, this is in context of one of the biggest movements of people in human history. So this it's not comparable, you know, to, to other lots of people talking about the Marshall Plan and what the US did in, 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 in the war. And I, I'm not sure if it's really comparable. You know, I, I agree with you that people get stuck on definitions, right? Definitions about who a migrant is and who a refugee is. That actually sidelines the conversation. Governments know how to respond to this. In the U.S., we resettle over 70,000 refugees every year and integrate them across the uh, country. It's actually shameful that the U.S. But government... But there's a difference there, though, isn't there, Nick, if, if you forgive me? 70,000 refugees across an entire country the size of the United States, and you're talking around a million going to Germany. You can understand why people may have concerns about that. Yes, but... If you put a proper integration program in place, help people learn the language, give housing, and after that, people actually contribute more to the economy afterwards. We know it from lots of studies and experience. I mean, that's why Germany has such a great economy now is that they have economic uh, uh, workers who are contributing, right? And those are Turks who immigrated there. This generation of Syrian refugees will be contributing to the economy in Europe and making it stronger in the future. That's something everyone should get behind. I want to introduce you all to Dr Nando Sigona, who's a refugee expert at the University of Birmingham and associate editor of the journal Migration Studies. Dr Sigona, what did you make of what Angelina Jolie-Pitt had to say today? I think it was, um, it was not idealistic in any ways. What we've seen in the last uh, months has been a very poor show from um, mostly Western liberal democracies about uh, how they to address the crisis. Um, I mean, in relation to what has been just said, well, 
it's true that the European Union has received a larger than um, larger number of refugees than in previous years, but this is not really much compared to other countries. So we must be very careful when we talk about this refugee crisis, not to conflate a perception by European member states with what is what is like 60 million refugees, internally displaced people that the UNCR is talking about and Angelina Jolie is talking about. I think we are confusing the two things very easily here. Um, for example, in relation to the relocation, yeah, you were mentioning that Germany has received 1 million um, uh, refugees and, and asylum seekers in the last year. And I think Germany may have some reason for for complaining with other European member states who have not done anything like that. Uh, I'm really worried that we're talking about this thing within the UK where the relocation, the participation into the relocation scheme has been null, nil, so no one has come from other European member states and it took uh, two votes by the House of Commons to just get the government to agree to resettle a few hundreds of unaccompanied manners. I think I just just to add to that, I, I do think I mean, there's a difference here, right? We're talking about policymakers and then we're talking about the everyday person and the everyday person has the best intention and the best will in the world. And I feel, especially in Britain, but also all over Europe, I mean, I've recently been to Idomeni camp uh, in, in Greece and the warmth and, and, and love and uh, mutual kind of help that the refugees show one another, I would be glad to welcome any of those people as a neighbour, uh, as a person in my community. When we're talking about policy and policy makers, there's, there's a certain, I don't know what it is, something has seeped into that, to, to the discourse about immigrants and migration that's really, really corrosive. Reading certain headlines as a refugee myself, as an immigrant, reading certain headlines, reading certain things, it, I just get chills because I think I've read about this in history books and none of this ever panned out so good. So we have to be careful also to, to, to make that differentiation between the, the policymakers who sometimes don't represent the everyday person. But yeah. also there are legitimate concerns, aren't there, that everyday people have that the local schools can't cope already. So what happens if suddenly we have loads of more people coming into our community? What about the local hospital? What about the fact that there's high unemployment in my sorry, community? Sorry, I don't understand why you say it's a legitimate concern. Because lots, people... will, lots of people will say that is a, legitim a legitimate concern. If they're in their why? community... Do they see that they're being pushed out, that they aren't getting a spot in the hospital? No, everyone gets a spot in the NHS. There's not a problem with that. And it, how well, you, say, not... you say that. I mean, the NHS, it's a different conversation but is on the on the brink of collapse it's on its knees at the moment if you speak to any doctor in the uk that no of course not happened. of course not but people <laughs> so but it's what, not a legitimate claim then but, let me say people will feel if they are listening whether it's in the uk whether it's in germany whether it's in hungary they may feel that if their local community is struggling with the number of people that they have already they feel it is a legitimate concern to be worried about more people coming in when there isn't the infrastructure to cope with that surely that's a legitimate concern no, I'm afraid it's not, because one thing is saying in Germany where they have received one million people, and there may be some legitimate concern, and the other thing is in a country like Britain, which has received 3,000 unaccompanied minors and 20,000 asylum seekers in the last year, well, every other major European country has received the hundreds of thousands of people. So let's not link together two countries which have a very different trajectory. About the policy, uh, in Canada has received in six months 25,000 relocated refugees. You know, Canada is a big country, but it's got a small population and with involvement of the local communities together working with the state. Sweden has received 35,000 unaccompanied minors in 2015 alone, which is more than what the UK has received in 10 years. But Dr. Sugana, that's in the context that Canada and Germany have an ageing population. They need migrants. They need people from Syria, people from Afghanistan, people from Pakistan, Iran to go there and work and be part of the workforce. Other countries might not... This is a very not... cynical reading, very cynical. In what, <laughs> anyway. in what ways is it... Because, there, because also, because the UK, well, it's got a slightly less aging population, but it's nothing like, you know, we are not yet getting younger in any way here. And other countries have received refugees, but not necessarily. The problem is, you know, the mis one of the mistakes that we are doing in the conversation here is to think that the refugees are a way, a, a tidal wave of people. If you look at the number of migration in general, 
the refugees, despite the 60 million people that UNCR is talking about, are still a minority. So if Germany wanted to address the aging population, the problem of aging, we'll get other measures in place. So you can get attracting other people from other routes, the normal migrants, the economic migrants. So explaining the why Germany accepted one minute through this story about the aging population, I think is very reductive. Professor, I have a question. This is hint here. Um, so, okay, we, we can say that cynical to, to think of, okay, uh, uh, Germany is accepting refugees for the, its economy. But also we have to think of what these countries are doing to the Middle East to kind of uh, uh, keep this kind of conflict going, which is like selling arms to countries uh, like Saudi Arabia or, or Emirates or five, look, four of the five uh, permanent members of the UN Council are involved in the Syrian conflict. So we have to think of the role of Germany, uh, France and the UK in selling arms to countries like Saudi Arabia. Yeah, to and obvi the... obviously you're, you're aware that the major weapon sellers to Saudi Arabia is UK, is not Germany. But, and... but there is like, <laughs> if you look at WikiLeaks, there are some of the documents uh, released through WikiLeaks uh, reveal that one of the co companies in Germany uh, is selling arms to Saudi Arabia. I, w yeah, I, want, no, to bring in, I want to bring in another no. guest as well who's been waiting very patiently. It's also worth pointing out in, in many German towns, and World Have You Say was in Germany at the end of last year as well, they're seeing their sports halls, their community centres being effectively temporary accommodation for the refugees who are arriving. And while many people feel hospitable, it's clearly having effect on their community yeah. because they are having to house so many people in such a short space of time. Time. Let's bring in Dr. Ralph Wilde, who's an expert in international law at University College London. Uh, Dr. Wilde, thank you for waiting patiently. I know you've been listening to the conversation. What would you like to say? Well, I began my career in international law working as a volunteer in the Dadaab refugee camps uh, in Kenya. And I think some of the discussion we've had already indicates a problem that many in Europe have in imagining that the situation we have here in Europe is somehow... Uh, exceptional. Whereas in fact, as indeed Angelina Jolie-Pitt pointed out in her speech, as we know, most uh, uh, refugees, forced migrants, travel from one developing country uh, to another. And uh, the concerns that some Europeans have about the impact on uh, scarce public resources are as nothing compared to the impact on uh, much less economically able countries of hosting many more uh, refugees and forced uh, migrants. Uh, and so I think it, it, one good thing, hopefully, that may come out of uh, this speech, if it brings the uh, using celebrity to bring an issue to the broader public consciousness, is what she said in it um, about the realities of uh, who is impacted on uh, by this situation uh, the most, which is to say people outside of Europe. I mean, for, I just wanted to go back really to, to a point that um, Jolie Pitt made in her speech. I think it's, it's really important to raise. She, she, tr she tried to outline the four, as she saw it anyway, the four root causes um, of, of the problem or of, of the situation, if you don't want to call it a problem. Um, I came to London, to Britain in 1994, we're in 2016, it's the same root problems, or at least they're very, very similar. They look very similar. And I have to agree with him sitting next to me here, and, and I suppose many of the other contributors in this debate, that the thing that Angelina Jolie Pitt did say that really resonated with me was that unless we go back and we fix these problems that persist since I left Afghanistan in 2000, uh, in 1994 till today, unless those problems are addressed, we are no cl closer to, to, to reaching. Whether you want to accept more uh, refugees or migrants or not, if you want to stop them coming, then that's what you have to do. We have to ask the question, why are they leaving the, their countries? And... And the answer is because it's war and conflicts and how these kind of conflicts started and what is keeping them going on. Um, this is one of the issues that's raised by um, Jeff, who's posted on the BBC Live page. Uh, sorry, Angelina, but the root of all this is war. Forgive me, but hasn't, wasn't the UN formed to deal with conflict? All I hear from you is that we, the world, needs to help refugees. No, the UN needs to get its act together to stop the conflict so we don't have refugees in the first place. Stop the problem at the cause, not deal with the symptoms. But that's easier said than done. Absolutely. And, and you know, hats off to her for standing there on the stage and... and, and 
trying to use her voice to move people. I mean, you know, we're sitting here talking about it. We're, you know, everyday people. I'm really hopeful that there are policymakers, there are governments, there are advisors, anyone, anyone who, who's going to watch this and actually think about it in, in a uniform way. I mean, the one thing I can only comment on Europe. I mean, I'm not, I, I don't know about anywhere else. The one thing that I've noticed in the last few years when this all started to happen is the absolute lack of coherence um, in tackling the issue. I mean, yeah, you've got conservative and right wing governments all over Europe or, or left wing governments or whatever. There is no unity. There is no single answer. And there's no point in trying to tackle something when, when you've got such a f sort of f f different groups trying to deal with it in different ways. We need to have a coherent voice at least in Europe, um, never mind the wider world, if we're going to deal with this. And I'm really hopeful that her speech does do that, if anything else. I want to introduce you to two more guests who are joining us now on World Have Your Say. Uh, Rosa is a student and volunteer from Hungary, currently living in Vienna, and Cora is in Cologne in Germany. Cora, we'll speak to you first of all. Um, we've been talking a lot about what Angelina Jolie-Pitt has been talking about today, the collective responsibility and how we all have to help these very desperate people. And they have to be desperate to get in a boat, risk their lives to come to Europe. From your perspective in Germany, where so many people have come... Do you think she was right in what she said today? Yes, I mean, there's a lot of German people who are taking huge responsibilities for the refugees here arriving here. And yeah, she was definitely right in saying that. Um, here in Germany at the moment, you can observe that there's indeed, there's many people who uh, have arrived from different countries. And there are many German people who are very happy to help them. And what about the fear aspect that um, Angelina Jolie-Pitt was talking about? Um, you know, you're in Cologne. Fear has been an issue in Cologne, hasn't it? Yes, recently, uh, I, I think the whole, almost the whole world is aware of the attacks that happened at New Year's Eve. And then, of course, fear was a big issue. Um, it's, it's spread a bit over Germany. And, you know, in Germany, there's the right wing populist party, the alternative for Germany, Alternative für Deutschland who has gained more and more votes throughout the past few months. So there is an issue of fear. And overall, you could say that German society is divided into those who are very happy and welcoming and help refugees. And on the other hand, there is people who are afraid. They don't know what is going to happen to Germany, uh, how to cope with the situation. It's them who are afraid and say, no, we would prefer to have less refugees in Germany. Let's bring in Rosa now as well. Rosa, what's your perspective from Vienna? Uh, yes, uh, I, 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 I would like to talk about the Hungarian situation as I'm more aware of that right now. And in Hungary, the government definitely tries to politically benefit uh, from <laughs> this crisis. And uh, I have to say that in Hungary, there are 2000 refugees right now. It's a small number. And in comparison to that, we are organizing a, a referendum against them for uh, 15 million euro. So you can feel the imbalance and how much propagandistic it is and how much uh, fear mongering it is. And uh, I think in Hungary, it's not uh, the, the whole story is not about the refugees. It's just about populism and uh, trying to uh, grab um, more power and uh, play the role of the savior. And of course, it's, it's a big issue, isn't it, in Hungary, the idea of building this this fence to keep people out. Um, what do, I know you, you've hosted a family of Syrian refugees in the past, but when you have those conversations with people in the supermarket, in the pub, in the restaurant, wherever it may be, what do generally do people say? Do they feel fearful, this fear that we heard from Angelina Jolie, or are they, are they welcoming of refugees? I think people are... Uh, generally uh, fear uh, of uh, things they don't know. And uh, especially it occurs when hate speech is uh, uh, made part of the discourse. So, so when it becomes acceptable to speak in a certain manner about people, then all those people who are very frustrated about uh, their own lives uh, will find a way to blame someone else. And I think that's the main goal of the government just to channel people's frustration and give them a scapegoat instead of letting them think of their real problems. Like half a million people left Hungary in the, in, since 2010. And now we are talking about 2000 people. Like it's, 
just totally nonsense, I think. And unfortunately, uh, people are in a bad condition enough to um, to to take part. Rosa, I, I just wonder, Rosa, I mean, you're in Hungary. I'm here in, in London, in, in the UK. Um, one of the things that, that An Angelina Jolie Pitt said that really resonated with me and just it took me a minute to really process it. She said that if as citizens of host countries or, or you know, countries that are affected by this, if the systems in place were so robust that we citizens could have complete confidence or as near a complete confidence in it as possible, then the rhetoric of hate, of fear, just will not affect us. And then the immigration issue doesn't become this political football that gets kicked around whenever someone fancies it. Do you think that? Do you think that if there was a robust enough system, that if we could have confidence in how these refugees and migrants were being dealt with, then, you know, we wouldn't be so fearful? Uh... I agree uh, with what Angelina said that, yes, if people would have more confidence in, in general and if people would feel better, then they would definitely <laughs> would not be so negative about something new, some, something unexpected. And uh, I also agree that the current situation has a lot to do with us, not with the refugees, with, 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 the, with our own system, how it handles us and... and uh, and uh, definitely uh, uh, improving our own system could also improve uh, how we handle other people. Cora, Cora. is there ever a conversation in Germany about when or if this has to stop? Certainly today, Angelina Jolie-Pitt was talking about anybody who is seeking asylum should be given space somewhere safe to live, whether it's in Europe or wherever. She was drawing a distinction with economic migrants, saying that they shouldn't be allowed to come. Is there ever a conversation in Germany about if there has to ever be an end point where they say, I'm sorry, we simply can't take in anybody else? Yeah, that's a huge debate, which is currently ongoing. Um, as you know, there have been um, often many refugees uh, coming to Germany since September. There were, you know, you saw the pictures on television. There were so many refugees, and you could also see them arriving at stations throughout Germany. This has come down now because of the EU-Turkey agreement, and now there's many refugees in Idomeni. Uh, and basically, currently, there's no refugees arriving in Germany, and um, this um, helps to calm down the huge debate which has been here between Angela Merkel and the conservative uh, Christian party, like the Bavarian party, Mr. Seehofer. And there was always the term of the Obergrenze, you know, should there be an exceeding limit where we say, no, this number, we can't take in any refugees anymore. But this idea completely goes against the UN Convention of Human uh, Rights and the Refugee Convention of the UN HCR. And therefore uh, it would be a break of rule of law i would i completely agree with you and i would just i'd just like to add also that this is my biggest fear as a refugee if i had thought oh the, you know i could be number one million and one and therefore the doors will be slammed in my face and i couldn't i wouldn't be here i wouldn't be who i am i wouldn't be alive potentially um that is the scariest you know, it, it, it's, it's just so worrisome for me to think about that because what we are doing now is we've turned our eyes away from the problem. And by mm. doing so, we've created a pressure cooker system. We, what we're saying is so long as we can't see it, maybe it will stop. Maybe it won't exist. And if, if, if there's any part of Jolie's speech, uh, Jolie Pitt's speech that I agree with, it's that, that, that at this precise moment in time, can we as a society, as a world, afford to take our eye off the ball because what we're seeing isn't pleasant? Well, tell us what you saw. You just said you've been to this camp at Idomini. Explain what you saw there. I mean, I'm an Afghan. I speak Farsi. I speak Dari. So a lot of the people, once they realised that, they came to me just asking for advice and asking for help, just saying to me, you know, you've got that little red passport. How can I get it? I just want my family. I want my kids to go back to school. I want my everyone to be safe. And there's no assurance. There's no... There's nothing I could offer them, even piecemeal, just to say it's going to be OK because the borders are shut. It's as though we have decided that we don't want to deal with this problem anymore, that they can go back. But exactly where are we sending them to? I mean, just a, a few days ago, there was a bomb blast in Iraq killing 41 people. Last month, 
another bomb blast killing up to 60 people and injuring hundreds in Afghanistan, in Kabul, the safe place. So exactly where are we going to send these people back to? How are we going to expect them to stop coming? Already there's talks of new routes coming through Libya into Italy. This problem isn't going anywhere. And if Jolie Pitt's speech can at least highlight that, then she's done well enough. Nelifar, thank you for joining us on World Have You Say. That's Nelifar Hadayat, who is a British Afghan journalist, also heard from Hind, we heard from Rosa, and we heard from Cora as well in Germany, in Vienna, and uh, Hind, who is from Saudi Arabia. I'm sure this is a conversation we're going to return to here on World Have Your Say. We do continue to reflect these conversations whenever you um, bring them to the top of any social media feed. We will continue to do that. Don't go anywhere. Plenty more to come on the BBC World Service.